Is this the opportunity of the century? Donald Trump's senior advisor believes he can end the decades-old conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. But why are so many skeptical? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is Jared Kushner's Middle East peace plan. Many have tried and failed to find a solution to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. But the White House thinks they now have the answer. Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, has unveiled the first part of his plan at a workshop in Bahrain, an economic blueprint for investment. He hopes $50 billion will be able to create a million jobs and double the Palestinians' GDP. But his proposal has faced widespread criticism, with many slamming it for failing to mention the political situation. And then, of course, the two protagonists aren't even at the event. The Palestinian Authority boycotted and Israel wasn't invited. So does Kushner's plan have any real chance of success? That debate in a moment. But first, Natalie Perhunen has this report. The White House has a game plan for peace in the Middle East. The main players, Palestine and Israel, aren't in the room to hear the strategy firsthand. But that's not a problem for the Trump administration, because this deal isn't supposed to be about politics, at least not yet. For now, it's all about the economy. Some people have mockingly called this effort the deal of the century. But at its core, it is not just about making a deal. In fact, this effort is better referred to as the opportunity of the century. Jared Kushner, who is also US President Donald Trump's son-in-law, has unveiled a $50 billion plan to revitalize the Palestinian economy and to create up to one million jobs. It's part of an ambitious agenda to develop Palestine over the next decade, from boosting infrastructure spending to building a viable tourism industry. But it comes with a few catches. No one has agreed to pay for these ideas, and the plan has been rejected by the Palestinians. But this is about the business of selling a vision. Kushner belongs to a family that is all about the art of the deal, and he's indicated there's little room for negotiation in this venture. That is why agreeing on an economic pathway forward is a necessary precondition to resolving what is a previously unsolvable political situation. The peace plan is being sold outside of the Palestinian territories. For many Palestinians, the idea of a unilateral plan without their input is unthinkable, as well as the concept of putting political issues to the side. We have not seen in the document any reference to ending occupation. This workshop is simply a political laundry for settlements and a legitimization of occupation. That would appear to be a death blow for the deal. But this is Donald Trump's attempt at building peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And he said he's willing to try to achieve it even without a two-state solution. So I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. I can live with either one. The Israeli government has criticized the Palestinians for not even considering the plan. Well, I would say that uh, we'll hear the American proposition, uh, hear it fairly and uh, with uh, openness. And I cannot understand how uh, the Palestinians, before they even heard the plan, rejected outright. This proposal is being made at a time when US ties to Israel appear unbreakable. The U.S. Embassy is now in Jerusalem. The White House has cut all U.S. aid for a U.N. body that specifically helps Palestinians. And there's a clear friendship between the Trump family and the Israeli leadership, all of which suggests the Palestinians' capacity to negotiate their own future appears extremely limited. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. 
Well, let's go to our panel now. In Chicago is Ali Abu Nima. He's the co-founder of the pro-Palestinian website, the Electronic Intifada. Tom Gross is in London. He's a Middle East media analyst. And in Washington, D.C. is Deborah Shushan. She's the director of policy and government relations at Americans for Peace Now, an organization with a pro-Israel, pro-peace, American Jewish perspective on policy issues. Good to have you all on the program. Tom Gross, when we look at Kushner's plan, tell me why this isn't anything other than a historically illiterate, bad infrastructure and real estate deal. Well, it's quite the opposite. It's actually the biggest economic aid package since the Marshall Plan. It involves at least $50 billion investment. It involves creating also the infrastructure for a possible future Palestinian state for good governance and so on, the rule of law and so on. And if you look at uh, other peoples around the world who are like aid, take the worst, like uh, people in Yemen or poor Syrians on the Jordanian-Syrian border or many other people, they can only dream of such an, um, such an investment opportunity. Ali Abu Nima. Well, that's just uh, pie-in-the-sky talking points. The reality is that this uh, effort by uh, the Trump administration is to distract attention. Even if we take it on its own economic terms, it's an effort to distract attention from what actually destroys a Palestinian wealth and economy and plunges millions of Palestinians into uh, poverty, and that's Israeli military occupation, settler colonialism, and uh, apartheid. And I'll give a very concrete example here. The World Bank has concluded that Israel's military restrictions on Palestinian businesses and farmers uh, in so-called Area C of the West Bank cost the Palestinian GDP 34 percent of its potential. So simply removing Israel's restrictions on letting Palestinians farm their own land, dig wells on their own land, build businesses on their own land, would be an immediate 34 percent jump in Palestinian GDP uh, without all this uh, fanfare of aid. The second issue that's incredibly important is one of credibility. We heard Kushner's speech about how much he cares for the Palestinian people. The plan contains quotes like, uh, a healthy uh, economy requires a healthy population, and claiming that there will be all sorts of investments in Palestinian health care. Well, let's see what the record is. The record is that when Kushner and the Trump administration came in, the first thing they did was cut off all U.S. aid to Palestinian hospitals in occupied East Jerusalem and cut off all aid to UNRWA, the UN agency that cares for the very poorest mm. Palestinian Let me uh, Let me try uh, and refugees. interpret that for a second, Ali. So perhaps, right, and again, I don't want to pretend to be their spokesman, but maybe they're saying we don't want to treat you like refugees anymore. We want to do business with you. What do you think? Well... Well, they are refugees. That's the problem. I mean, millions of Palestinians are refugees and not allowed to return to their native land for one reason alone, which is that they're not Jewish. And that's why when Palestinians say Israel is a racist state or an apartheid state, that's what they mean. The sole reason two million people are caged in the Gaza Strip and shot at by snipers uh, if they try to escape or protest, is because they're not Jews. If they were Jews, Israel would tear down the fences, tear down the watchtowers, stand down the snipers, and invite them all to return to the uh, lands and right. villages from which they're expelled. So that that's the, right. the reality is they are refugees. Right. You can't wish it away. And this is an attempt to go around the reality to pretend it's something that it's not, and that the Palestinians mm -hmm. are just ungrateful and stubborn, and poor little innocent Israel is at no fault. Deborah, are they wasting their time in Bahrain? Yes and no. Um, they are wasting their time in the sense that I, I would certainly agree that this is all smoke and mirrors, and frankly, it's embarrassing uh, for the United States government to be engaging in such a, an utterly amateurish exercise that is divorced from reality. On the other hand, uh, I think the, we, we should give credit uh, where credit is due to the Kushner team, uh, the, the uh, architect of which, in terms of its policies, is really David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador to Israel. Uh, they've been incredibly successful in carrying out their agenda as 
terrible as it is for Palestinians and as terrible as, as it is for Israel, uh, in terms of uh, those Israelis and those of us uh, diaspora Jews and others who care about Israel and care about its future as a liberal democracy, as a national home for the Jewish people, um, they've been incredibly successful uh, in the sense that they are helping to put into place the agenda of Israel's right wing and ultra right wing. Um, my, my fear is that this is an exercise in distraction, and it's an exercise when Kushner calls it, uh, rather than now the deal of the century, it's the opportunity of the century, what he is setting up is the possibility that, uh, because Palestinians have already soundly rejected it for very good reasons, uh, some of which were just outlined by Ali in, in his comments, when Palestinians reject it, it sets up the opportunity mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, the Trump administration right. and for Netanyahu and his government to say, ah, look, once again, the Palestinians uh, have not missed an opportunity to miss right. an opportunity. And the Trump administration can then say, over to you, Israeli government, you do what you need to do in order to further your interests, in order to maintain your security. Uh, we had Prime Minister Netanyahu, before the last elections, immediately before, announce his plans uh, to annex the Israeli settlements uh, in the West Bank. And so this, you know, this gives the go-ahead. Right. The, the Trump administration okay. will give the go-ahead, as really Friedman has already done, for that to be put into place. And right. that's disastrous, not only for the Palestinians, but for Israel as well. So, Tom Gross, there's no appetite from the Palestinians for this. They're actually protesting in the West Bank. They're protesting in Gaza. Might the plan have had more credibility if, in addition to this $50 billion long-term infrastructure project and this vision, the architects... Kushner and his team also said, you know what, Israel, you have to give up the occupation. The West Bank settlements are not sustainable. That's not a good thing. You need to give up something as well. There's none of that there. Well, sorry. As I understand it, uh, the Kushner team have um, said there's going to be the political aspect for the plan. What they're arguing, and uh, let's presume there's going to be a possibility of an independent Palestinian state. You have to set up the infrastructure, the institutions, the economy for such a state to work so it won't be a failed state on day one. Um, the plan is not only about money. It's also about good governance, good institutions, property rights, the rule of law. A friend of mine who works at the Bank of England, who I spoke to earlier today, said it's one of the most impressive economic plans he's ever seen, and he is not a fan of the Trump administration. So your other guests might want to study this plan a little bit and ask, what on, how on earth okay. does it help the Palestinian people to turn down $50, 50 okay. billion dollars in economic aid? Okay. Um, of course, it's not the end of the matter. Right. But just to turn it down and complain, I mean, there's not another people on earth that wouldn't, who I'm talking about another people. Right. Who and, and you, said, you mentioned that earlier. Like, yes. OK, so like let me ask Ali. Don't need uh, those, uh, I want to pull out, uh, Ali, Ali, one second. I want to I wanna pull out one small part of the plan, right? So, for example, you look, you look at the document. There's one thing that says $150 million for new solar power facilities in Gaza. They have terrible electricity cuts. Hamas can't keep it together. The PA can't even, you know, pay people's salaries and so on. In and of itself, $150 million for solar power in Gaza. You wouldn't really be against that, would you? No, of course I wouldn't be against that. But there's a couple of things. First of all, it's a lie that it's $50 billion for the Palestinians. I mean, T Tom Gross should read the plan because it claims... No, no, it's 50. I didn't say only for the Palestinians. Also yeah, you, for you, you, some you of did, it's regional. Did, I yes, didn't... OK. Yes, no, but, but it's it connected says 50 to the creation of the Palestinian. Right. It says better, better fifty situation. billion dollars, fifty billion dollars over ten years, of which twenty-five billion would uh, allegedly go to the Palestinians over ten years. For, of course, first of all, this is unfunded. No one knows where the money will come from. Secondly, that two and a half billion dollars a year is less than the wealth-destroying effects of Israeli military occupation. So simply ending the occupation, removing Israeli mili military restrictions, ending, uh, ending Israeli theft and colonization of Palestinian land, ending uh, Israeli restrictions on Palestinian businesses would be f worth far more than this pie in the sky. But to answer our host's question, 
about solar panels. Of course, solar panels would be great. It, the Israeli army is busy destroying solar panels in the West Bank so that Palestinians can't farm their land. The reason there's an electricity crisis in Gaza is because Israel restricts the amount of fuel coming in as part of its collective punishment of the population in Gaza. Israel restricts uh, spare parts coming in from Gaza, for, for Gaza's only power plant, which Israel has bombed repeatedly. The, this pie-in-the-sky plan addresses, it doesn't even acknowledge these realities. Again, uh, Tom is trying to present this as Oh, this is a lovely, generous opportunity from Jared Kushner and company who simply want the best for Palestinians while ignoring the reality that, that the United States and under the instigation of the, the Kushner team has been aggressively supporting all of Israel's attacks on the Palestinian people, all of the wealth-destroying, economy-destroying, tree-destroying, water-polluting, uh, uh, realities of military occupation. And if we don't talk about that, then what this is, is a trolling exercise. So at the end of the day, uh, people like Tom and people like Kushner can say, oh, you know, we tried, we did our best, right. but those stubborn, okay. greedy Palestinians... Well, right. so, 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 okay. so, so Tom, both, Tom, both, Tom, both Deborah and Ali have said that essentially, yeah. when, after all is said and done, this isn't going to work out, and those who are currently sitting in Bahrain can just say, well, we gave it our best, but the Palestinians never want to show up and well, they don't care. Address okay. that. First of, first of all, um, I resent, I'm not Jared Kushner, I'm not American. I want the best for the Palestinians. Um, look, we're living in the reality of the situation. Israel is a strong country. Only yesterday there was a trilateral meeting of national security advisors with the two superpowers, America and Russia, in Jerusalem with Israel. The reality is that in order to create a better situation for the Palestinians and a Palestinian state, just to boycott talks, and it's not just the Trump administration, over the eight years of the Obama term, they, the Obama officials said also the Palestinians' authority barely wanted to talk. What is there to lose by sitting down and engaging engaging and talking. How do you know it's going to be a failed plan if you don't even turn up and you don't even try talking? I mean, what, 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 what uh, you say pie in the sky, you've used that phrase twice. What exactly, how exactly do you hope to advance a better situation on the ground for the, popul the Palestinian population of Gaza yeah. and the West let, Bank? Let me ask if you, you a don't question, think, if, you don't, if you don't... OK, but, but, I, but I'd rather than uh, point scoring asking me questions, I'd rather you reply to that. No, okay, I, I'd ahead. like to ask you a simple question. Do you uh, oppose Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank? I am in general for two states. I'm for any people that no, want self No, that wasn't the question let me finish. I asked. Let me fin you asked me a question. You're going to let me finish, OK? I'm for self-determination of any peoples, OK? I'm also for the right of minorities to live within countries. So if Jews want to live in a future Palestinian state under Palestinian law, I think they should be allowed to live there, just as uh, Palestinian Arabs uh, definitely do and should live in Israel. And I would apply that to any state in the world. Okay, so I, I don't like ask that, that wait, question. Wait, wait, wait. Is Israeli no, 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 settlements no. are not lawful. They are land theft and against international law. And I asked whether well, you support a, or oppose that, and you couldn't answer no. it. And that's the problem with, with this I discussion. Did, actually, I did Actually, I did answer it. Um, first of all, uh, there are legal experts that disagree with that. But broadly speaking, I'm for Palestinian self-determination. Okay. If Jews, if under a peace treaty, in fact, I would okay. say it's healthy okay. any society okay. to allow a minority to live in peace there. Okay. So, Deborah, fundamentally at the heart of this is the requirement of this peace plan that the Palestinians capitulate to a vision that has been created by... Netanyahu and Trump, and is that going to be impossible? Well, of course, the Palestinians will never agree to that. I mean, we, you know, we don't know what's in the uh, what's in this Kushner plan. It's been promised for uh, for the lion's share of two years now, and put off regularly uh, most of the time with regard to developments on the Israeli political scene, elections, and so forth. Um, but 
what we do know is that we have a Trump administration uh, that has made absolutely clear its animosity to two states. Uh, we have ridiculous interviews in which people like David Friedman say, well, what is a state? Uh, two states mean different things to different people, says Jason Greenblatt. Uh, they refuse to acknowledge the reality of occupation, with David Friedman uh, stripping out the word occupation from State Depor Department human rights reports. So I, I think even though we haven't seen this plan, uh, we have every uh, reason, every basis on which to gauge uh, what it's fundamentally about, that it won't contain anything resembling uh, real and viable statehood for the Palestinian people. Uh, and, of course, that's been a non-starter. I mean, that is a non-starter. You have the Palestinian Authority, uh, which has continued under Mahmoud Abbas uh, to uh, push for a two-state solution, uh, to desire a two-state solution. You have an Israeli government under ben Benjamin Netanyahu that has now made very clear uh, that it does not desire that. The Trump administration does not, as well. Uh, of course, this is going to be something that the Palestinians reject. And, again, it's ultimately not in Israel's interest, either. Israel's interest is in living in peace and security uh, with the Palestinian state. And, and I think it's, it's pretty clear, even though we haven't officially seen this plan, that that's not going to be what's on the table. Okay. So it's been fascinating talking to all of you. Ali Abu Nima, Tom Gross, and Deborah Shushan. I've got to move on. Thanks so much. In July 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was blown out of the sky, killing everyone on board. Almost five years on, three Russians and one Ukrainian have now been charged with their murders. The doomed jet was shot down over conflict-torn eastern Ukraine, where Russian-backed separatists were fighting government forces. But Moscow denies any involvement. The trial for the four men is set for 2020. But with the Kremlin denying the evidence and refusing to extradite, will justice ever be served? In a moment, I'll ask the mother of one of the victims what she thinks. But first, this report by Adam Pletz. Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 was hit by a Russian-made missile in July 2014. It went down in eastern Ukraine while flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur over the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic, at the time, as now, an active conflict zone between Ukraine and pro-Russian separatists. All 298 people on board were killed. Most of them were Dutch, and last week, an international investigation, led by the Netherlands, announced the suspects they believe were responsible for the attack. The men will be charged with murder. The four persons where it goes, as first, Igor Girkin. Sergei Dubinsky, Oleg Pulatov, and Leonid Kharchenko. Three of the accused are Russian, including Igor Gherkin, former self-proclaimed defense minister of the Donetsk People's Republic, and a fourth is Ukrainian. Investigators have said these suspects may not have pushed the button that launched the missile that brought down Flight MH17, but they were responsible for deploying it. They say their investigation links the attack directly to Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin has been dismissive of the investigation's findings. Given that Russia's constitution forbids the extradition of its citizens, the lead Dutch prosecutor recognizes that the Russian suspects are unlikely to ever face charges in court. Well, the three of them are in the Russian Federation, and the chance that they will come voluntarily to the Netherlands yeah, is, is, of course, not too big. Nonetheless, all four suspects will be tried in absentia, if necessary, beginning in March. But is justice without punishment really any justice at all. Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now is Selena Fredericks. Her son, Bryce, was on Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. She joins us now from Rotterdam. It's good to have you on the program, Selena. Thanks for joining us. Do you feel that with those 
four men being charged, you are now closer to justice for your son? Yes, I think so. We've waited uh, for five years for this moment. We have a date now that the process will start in names. So I think we're a step further. Tell me what, it, what it's been like trying to find out exactly what happened over the past five years. Uh, there has been a lot of news in the media and you don't always know what you can believe or not. But after a while, you know what, what, what is true and what can't be true. Um, actually, soon after it happened, um, the, uh, there was an investigation by a couple of newspapers that found out that uh, the book came from uh, the 53rd Battalion in Kursk. So now it appears that uh, that most likely is true. Mm -hmm. At least the book came from there. Vladimir Putin has dismissed this as he has dismissed yeah. many other things over the past yeah. few years, whether it was the investigative work of Bellingcat and the yeah. Dutch investigators and, and so on. And he still maintains there's no clear evidence. How do you feel about that? I think uh, in the beginning, I, I listened to everybody, also to, to what Russia had to say, but they have told so many lies and denied things that they couldn't deny because there was a lot of evidence. So, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't believe anything anymore from Russia. Hmm. Now, your son was on a flight from Schiphol Airport, I think, and yeah. heading towards Malaysia. Uh, yeah. How, how does it? Uh, I mean, how how does to it Bali, feel? Actually, so, sorry. They were heading to Bali. Oh right, of course. So uh, stopping yeah. off, uh, yeah. perhaps in in Malaysia. Yes. Yeah. How does it feel that your your innocent boy was involved in a big geopolitical mess, flying over a conflict zone and getting embroiled in, in all of this and losing his life? Yeah, uh, it feels like we're in the center of of uh, a big war. We're part of it. Um, I never heard of the, the, the whole thing before, of course. And now we're part of it. Do you think that there has been adequate or enough focus on the 298 innocent people who lost their lives um, over the past few years? Well, I think so. Uh, here in the Netherlands, has been they've been a lot uh, in the media. And there's a lot of attention, yes. If you had the opportunity to address the Russian leadership, what would you tell them? Please uh, be honest. Uh, tell us the truth. We know most likely it has been a mistake. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Just take responsibility. Do what you have to do. Selena, it can't. It can't be easy talking about it over and over, even when we reach out to you, when, when media reach out to you, as the mother of someone who, who died on, the, on that plane. Does it, does it become more difficult over time? Uh, it goes up and down. Uh, it's 24 hours a day in my head, and I think about the children all of the time. And hmm. Yeah. I keep fighting for the truth together with uh, a few other families. What would give we you, I, I mean, you can never, you can't get your son back, but would you have a sense no. of, a semblance of closure if you can see people in the dock convicted and sent to jail for the rest of their lives? Is that what you would like to see? Um, I would like to see that, but the most important thing to me is knowing the truth. Why? Why could this happen? Who did it? Uh, why uh, uh, MH17? Hmm. Why that plane? A civilian plane. They were flying a lot of civilian planes over there. People who pushed the button knew there were civilian planes. How, how could this happen, happen? What were they thinking? That's the main Selena. important answers I'd like to hear. Selena Fredericks, I know this is not easy for you and I thank you very sincerely for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Let's broaden out the discussion with two new guests. Samuel Ramani is a Russian foreign policy researcher at Oxford University. 
And in New York is Ukrainian-American political analyst Andrei Dobriansky. Good to have you guys on the show. Andrei, is the case a strong one against these four men? Uh, it's more than strong. Uh, uh, again, we know more about this uh, flight downing than any terrorist or any flight that's gone missing over the last decade or more. Uh, the Ukrainian security services released audio recordings uh, that were intercepted uh, almost immediately thereafter. Uh, open source research on the Internet uh, showed us the exact route of the Buk missile launcher, uh, which lined up exactly with what was being talked about on the intercepts. Uh, we have uh, communications that were self-posted online by the people who were named in this, uh, in this document by the joint investigation team. This is probably as a slam a door, open and shut case as you can possibly get, and yet the world is still stymied by Russia. Uh, its inability to move forward with this. We're talking about people who are probably be able to be prosecuted for war crimes in the case of Stilkov, uh, war crimes in several different countries for what he's done. And yet this man remains at large, will never be sent to prison mm -hmm. as long as Putin is uh, protecting him. Yeah, well, yeah, it seems as if th these people will never be extradited for as long as Putin con continues to say what he's saying right now, which is, I absolutely disagree with the evidence. Samuel Romani, why is Putin continuing with this line despite what seems to be a mountain of evidence? What's so wrong with the Russians going, you know what, a few bad apples, they screwed up and they made a mistake and they shot down a plane from the sky. Why, why won't they do that, Samuel? I think there's a number of reasons why they wouldn't necessarily uh, do that. First of all, they want to try to discredit the, uh, his uh, investigation as much as possible. And the primary argument is that Russia wasn't consulted in the uh, in the investigation or wasn't an active participant in it. So by admitting its credibility would be uh, uh, kind of a, a blow to a lot of the reasoning on other crises too. For example, the Skripal crisis, they advanced the same idea that there was a Russia judgment prematurely by the British. The Russians didn't have a chance to present evidence or have their say. So there's a, this is a, an issue that's linked to many others and the issue of Russian consultation rises to the fore. And secondly, I think that Russia still doesn't want to try to convey any kind of uh, notion that it's lost control over certain lower levels of the military or the chain of command, and in particular, people in Donetsk uh, who were involved in this. Because one of the figures who was being uh, uh, prosecuted for this was Gherkin, the Minister of Defense in the Donetsk People's Republic. And as you know, there's already been uh, violence in both Luhansk, where Plotinsky was overthrown in a coup d'etat, and in uh, Donetsk last year, where Zakharchenko was assassinated. And I don't want to create a situation that Russia has lost control over its own militants and its own proxy groups in, in eastern Ukraine, because that reflects very badly on, the, on Putin's ability to hold the line and save uh, cohesion at home. Andre, would this snowball Andre. into a sort of political momentum that the Russians feel they don't want when things are kind of going okay for them in eastern Ukraine because of the facts on the ground? Well, it's not, it's not so much that uh, they're in any position to snowball against them. I mean, just this week, we had uh, the Council of Europe uh, readmit Russia's voting privileges uh, without Russia uh, acceding to anything, uh, acceding to any of their eight or nine resolutions over the last five years of letting Russia know that they have violated many international conventions, uh, many rights of the rest of the European body, and yet uh, Russia is able to sway enough voting members of the Council of Europe to admit it without admitting any wrongdoing, uh, without changing any of its practices. And uh, this will continue, especially going forward, if Nord Stream 2 continues, uh, Russia will have even more of a political influence influence uh, with its energy policy towards Russia. I don't think Russia is going to do anything so long as the rest of the world doesn't do more than the tiny, tiny sanctions that we've had so far. These are these are nothing in comparison to the sanctions the world body has put on rogue regimes like Iran or uh, uh, North Korea. Even uh, even in some respects, Cuba has more sanctions against it by the by the U.S. than than the than other countries. I don't think Russia has felt the sting. Russia is very capable of uh, riding it out from the oligarch side. They are billionaires. They have enough money. And I don't think they really care about the uh, international influence on, on their people. So long as the oligarchs have what they have, they're never going to change their minds. Samuel Romani, would extra pressure on the Russian government make a difference when it comes to, for example, admitting some form of responsibility in this atrocity? I think that actually there's very little that, Russia, that the West can do to actually pressure Russia credibly on this issue. Because 
the well, what if they if they could have done it, they probably would have already done that. Additional sanctions are really futile when many European countries, as Andrews noted, are still dependent on uh, Nord Stream two and on Russian gas. So there's a limit to how far you can isolate a country like Russia that's seen as a great power, this UN Security Council member state that's actively involved in crises of vital interest to the United States, whether it be Syria to Afghanistan. So there's really not that much more that can be pressured. And Putin has made a clear point that the more the uh, West pressures them, the more he can create a siege mentality at home and he can use this for regime consolidation. Because the overwhelming perception within Russia ever since the 1999 Kosovo War has been that Western foreign policy is ridden with double standards. It, it's aimed at promoting U.S. hegemony at the expense of consulting other global powers like Russia. And the fact that Russia was not consulted in this MH17 uh, investigation plays into that domestically. And uh, the fact that the West is putting more and more pressure on this actually will strengthen position at, uh, Putin's position at home and not weaken it. So it's something of a paradox. The more you push him, the stronger he gets. And yeah. the uh, okay. return to the cancer right. of Europe is just a, right. is a recognition of that. Right. right. So let me ask, Andre, do you agree with that it is a paradox that the more you push them, the more they strengthen at home because of the siege mentality? They're out to get us. The West has it in for us. They're fabricating things against us. Putin only gets stronger. Do you necessarily agree with that? Well, I think from the public opinion polls, um, we're, we're seeing that, that Putin probably is not as at his high point as he was uh, after the invasion of Crimea. We know that after being involved in seven or eight different conflict zones around his border uh, and then Syria and, and moving on past that, I don't know what what appetite there is. There's no there's no prize as big as Crimea for Putin to whip out of his hat to, to go invade and, and try to get uh, public attention back home unless he wants to invade any of the Baltic territories. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in terms of his popularity. But again, time after time, whether it's the Council of Europe admitting Russia again, whether it's the world anti-doping body saying, oh, right, Russia can go back to the Olympics next year, that'll probably be happening as well. It's just, uh, it's just a matter of very weak uh, deliberations against, uh, against Russia. Yes, Europe extends its Crimea sanctions. Yes, the United States extends sanctions. But the pressure has not been ramped up uh, per the uh, serial violations by Russia. And it's not just what happens in Ukraine. It's, it's what's currently on the ground in Georgia still. It's the fact that Russian troops are in, in Moldova. It's the fact that Russians are attacking and bombing indiscriminately in Syria and other places. These are This is the actions of a regime that needs to be crucially changed. This is not something that the world can, can abide by. And frankly, up until this point, we have allowed Russia to dictate its terms of, of conflict. Russia has the largest border of any country in the world as a largest country. The United States and other, uh, other countries should be making sure that Russia has to defend its territorial areas in the Arctic and other areas. Make sure that Russia is on the defensive at this point and sanction it more. Really, really get those sanctions on uh, any country that wants to do uh, any deal with Nord Stream 2. That cannot be allowed to go forward. Samuel, the chances of the Russians sending at least three of these men to the Netherlands to face trial, zero? I would say it's uh, next to zero. I mean, like, if you look at the reaction to the Mueller investigation, too, where there were numerous Russians tied to the GRU who were indicted, Putin was offering a swap deal, basically, bring Americans who Russia would want to prosecute over in exchange for them. And I think that that's probably what Putin at best might offer with regards to MH17. Bring some Europeans who they've been tracking on Interpol, whether they be political dissidents, whether they be people just that the Russian state doesn't like, in exchange for these people. That would be the only way I think they would deport these people back, unless something materially changes in Donetsk that causes Russia to lose con more control over that area. Andre Dobryansky, a few minutes ago, I spoke to Selina Fredericks, who lost her son on that flight, one of the 298 people killed. Is the cold, harsh reality that she's never going to fully get justice for the murderers of her son? I think that was a very moving interview. Uh, I think it's very important, the fact that you made sure that her voice is heard, because it's the voice of the victims. Again, these are 298 innocent people. They had nothing to do with it. There were so many children on that flight. And I think uh, what, you, what you said about making sure that, that this person gets justice is part of it. I would, at the very least, would like the families to be able to actually step on the soil of where the plane was down. And that currently is impossible because Russian militants, Russian military operations are preventing people uh, from being there and preventing the, the, the creation of a, of a memorial, a sacred place, uh, where any other devastated uh, uh, victim of a, of a tragedy is able to gather. This is something that is not even possible today. And this is now five years after the fact. Something needs to change. 
I think you're right about justice needing to happen. I think it's the rest of the world needs to finally stand up to Russia and say, no more. We cannot allow you to do this, because if, they, if it's happened once, twice, and three times in terms of massive violations of international law, why won't it continue to happen again? Samuel Romani and Andrei Dobriansky, pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining us. For many in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service is a source of pride. It provides free health care to all its citizens. But how well is it treating its own staff? A new report has found that doctors from ethnic minorities are being treated like outsiders. The investigation was commissioned by the General Medical Council after it emerged that physicians from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups were twice as likely to face disciplinary action and their white counterparts. Well, let's speak to one of the authors of the report. Roger Klein joins us from London. He was a director for equality at the NHS and is now a research fellow at Middlesex University Business School. Roger, good to have you on the program. So there's some fascinating claims here and disturbing, a couple of things that probably need clearer and deeper understanding. Are we being unfair if we suggest and extrapolate out of it that the NHS has a racism problem? Uh, the NHS does have a problem with racism. Um, our research suggests it's uh, a bit more complicated than that. But overall, um, research that myself and um, other colleagues have done over the last four or five years has shown that in, in many respects, black and minority ethnic staff in the NHS, not just doctors, um, are treated not as well, less favourably than their white um, colleagues. And that's in terms of how their chances of being appointed, promoted, um, the likelihood that they'll be disciplined. And this piece of research um, is an extension of that work. When so you, there's a problem. Certainly. So when you delved into it, were there more examples of deliberate, specific meanness and discrimination and racism? Or was it more a case of a kind of soft, general background tone of discrimination that, that wasn't direct? I, I, think we f I think we feel that, or we found, that much of it is uh, unintended. There is clearly some deliberate racism, but much of it is uh, unintended. And it's the consequence of... Um, bad systems, bad approaches, and in particular, failing to recognize that um, if we recruit doctors, which the National Health Service does do, from all around the world, it's really important that when they arrive here, we recognize that it might take some time for them to adapt to working in our health mm -hmm. system. They might need additional support. Um, it, that when things go wrong, it's really important that we're not too quick to blame people, but we try and learn if things have gone wrong. Because what our data shows is it's less black and minority ethnic staff who are trained in the UK who are subjected to discipline and referrals to the regulator. It is doctors who are trained overseas, international medical graduates, as we call right. them. And could these be more easily attributed to cultural differences, but perhaps they're getting referred because people don't quite understand them properly? It's a mixture of things. So, um, we, we, first of all, we find that when people arrive in this country, do, we, we, we invite doctors to come and work in this country because we need doctors. There's no evidence that doctors who come and work in the UK are any less skilled mm -hmm. and capable the doctors who are trained in the UK. But there are differences about some of the ways in which healthcare is delivered. So, for example, uh, consent. Um, in, the, in, in the UK, we have a very high level of expectation that patients uh, will be involved in the way in which their care is provided. So, if I, as a doctor, say to a nurse, make sure this uh, patient has some um, water, um, the patient may have a say about when they want their water and how much water mm -hmm. they have. But if that's not been the, the practice in 
the country you've trained in, you could easily get that wrong. Similarly, confidentiality. We have very strict rules on confidentiality for patient information, but in some countries, it is a much um, more relaxed attitude, and it's normal to share information with family members. If you don't get, if you don't explain to people and give people the chance to learn um, that. It, they, whilst their clinical skills may be very good, in other respects they can, mm -hmm. they can get it wrong. For example, how you do a ward round in a hospital, how you run a clinic, how you share information with patients, how you listen to patients may well be different. How you work with nurses if you're a doctor. In some countries, there's a very strict hierarchy between doctors and nurses. In the UK, there is a hierarchy, but it's a much more relaxed hierarchy than it used to be. And you can easily um, get that wrong if you are a doctor that's been trained right. in a different tradition. Right. I'm glad you gave me a, a few examples because it, it helps us put a kind of narrative to this because initially, you know, you just you're not sure, is this just this kind of open racism or is it something more nebulous that we're, we're trying to understand here? Now, with that stat that half as many whites have been referred to the GMC, the regulatory body, by NHS employers for investigation, and that could lead you to lose your job, than, than others, right? Uh, blacks, Asians, and, and so on. When yep. you were the director for equality at the NHS, did you notice this pattern was it clear to you that this was happening well what we know what, what we noticed what I noticed what the data showed me was that for all staff not just doctors if you were from a black and minority ethnic background you were more likely to be disciplined and to try and understand that we realized that the key, the most important moment that determines whether or not you are going to be disciplined is at the point where something happens, a behavior issue, a mistake is made. Because if at that point there's a culture of uh, looking for who's to blame rather than how do we learn from this mm -hmm. and um, make sure it doesn't happen again, if you have a blame culture, as we call it, mm -hmm. it is more likely that people who are different, who are outsiders, are going to be investigated and blamed than people who know how to navigate the system and who are seen as one of us. So I wasn't surprised that this applies specifically to doctors because we know these, policies, th these practices um, apply generally in the health service. It's particularly at the point where something happens, the attitude that's taken by the managers and by the employer will determine what happens uh, later on over the next few weeks and months. Right. And I want to ask you a final question that's maybe outside of your direct domain of expertise, but perhaps on a parallel here. The study in the British Medical Journal finding that black and minority ethnic consultants on average earned about 5% less than white colleagues in basic pay, almost £5,000 a year. Shall we fold that into a general culture of one group being treated better than others? I think the answer is yes and no. Um, the, uh, there's no doubt about it that um, the, the way in which be it black and minority ethnic staff generally are treated in the NHS, including the way in which they are promoted, um, suffers from discrimination. As far as doctors' pay is concerned, that will be affected by their seniority by what are called clinical excellence awards, and certainly in the past, both for uh, black and minority ethnic doctors and for female doctors, there's been a real problem that they, their awards have been less mm -hmm. than they are for um, white doctors and for male doctors. And the other issue will be that um, because the uh, many of the black and minority ethnic doctors in the NHS, not all, but a significant number, uh, are relatively young. They are obviously, uh, some of them, on lower salaries than their more senior colleagues who've been here for a long time. So it's a mixture of seniority, 
but it's also a mixture uh, of opportunity. And certainly, in terms of those opportunities, there have been patterns of discrimination in the past. Uh, and, you know, we're a country that we, we scour the world looking for doctors. If we want to do that successfully, we have to treat them all fairly. Roger Klein, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us here on the Newsmakers. El último mensaje que me mandó el sábado me puso de que mamá te amo me puso cuídense nosotros aquí estamos bien yo cuando leí ese mensaje no sé a mí me dieron ganas de llorar porque yo lo sentí como que si fue una despedida That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, evidence that French police are using excessive force against protesters has prompted the UN human rights chief to call for an investigation. Will abuses be uncovered? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.